I know that it's hard being a mum because I, I do it, but I always try not to let that be an excuse. Sure. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's all a juggling act really, but yeah. yeah, because I'm so passionate about rugby league and where I know where I want to be and what I want to do that I'll do anything um, in order to make it happen. That's not multitasking, what is? Sorry, man, we lost. <laughs> yeah. Good everyone. everyone. Uh, welcome to our NZRL podcast, Find Your Front, episode number three. Um, we're here today with a very special guest, someone we're really excited to talk to. Um, before we do that again, uh, just thank you to the One NZ Warriors for uh, partnering with us on these important conversations around well-being and wellness. Um, again, my name's Cliff Thompson. Uh, I'll let the great man introduce himself once again. Talofa kia my name's Ali Lawatiti. Thanks for having me. Dynamic, bro. Awesome. Um, <laughs> But we're gonna jump. We're gonna jump straight over to our special and wonderful guest here today, and that's um, Crystal Rota. And uh, we're really grateful to have you here, Crystal, with us. Um, and before before we kick start, I mean, you've you've done a num- played a number of teams, a number of things. But yeah, just just want to rattle off, say hello, and then tell us your Kiwi number, your, your Warriors number, um, and just a bit about sort of who you are, where you come from. Yep, kia ora everybody. Um, thank you guys for having me. Um, so my name is Crystal Rota, obviously. Um, warrior number nine, which is a special number to me. Um, Knights number nine, um, Māori All Stars number nine, Kiwi Ferns one, two, four. Um, so I am of Māori and European background, um, but love all cultures, very diverse and being around many cultures um thanks to the space of footy. Um, so, you know, footy is a very passionate space for me and I love being a part of footy. I'm a mum of two. Mm. Um, I have a son who is 15 and his name is Lariko and a daughter, Nikaela, who is nine. Mm, nice. nice. Thank you. And so you mentioned, obviously, about your, your Maori heritage, your whakapapa there. So you want to talk us a little bit about that, sort of where you're born, where you grew up, where your whanau come from and, and some of those family ties? Yeah, so um, my dad is Maori. And my mum is European. Um, so my dad's um, mother is from um, up north in a place called Pangaru, so the far, oh. far north. Um, so Te Rarua, so from up there. And then my dad's dad is from um, a little place called Matata, just out of Whakatane. Oh. Um, so Te Arawa down there. So Te Rarua and Te Arawa descent. Um, and, yeah, very proud of my Māori heritage. Um, it's done a lot of things for me Um in regards to the person who I am today. Um, I connect really closely with, um, you know, my Māori whakapapa and, um, you know, I go home a lot and w- when I say home, I talk mm. about um, Matata because that was where my family have um, sort of always resided and um, we've always sort of been back to and that's where our marae is. And so, you know, all my memories growing up as a kid playing at the marae, playing tiggy yeah. and um, go home, stay home and all those kinds of things um, at the front of our marae on the mm. marae aateas, you know, memories that um, are always fond in my mind um, as a kid growing up. Yeah, nice. And so if we sort of skip ahead a little bit your introduction into into sport and maybe rugby league i'm sure people would be interested to know how did that come about for you and where did that all kick start yeah so um i actually played netball all my life growing up um i was a netballer so um right through the junior junior grades i played netball up until i was about 17 um and the reason being is because um that was the dominant um sport in our family for females and um my grandfather and um, my uncles and aunties on my dad's side believed that um, rugby league was for men. So um, it was frowned upon in our family for females to play rugby league. So, you know, none of, none of us played rugby league, rugby or anything of the like, um, if you were female. Um, so, right. yeah, I played netball. Um, and then we had uh, first 15 at school um, when I was at high school. I was at James Cook High School. And um, they said, oh, just come here around. I said, oh. Nah, you know, my, my family don't play. And they're like, what do you mean your family don't play? And I said, oh, you know, my family believe that's for men. And then, um, you know, I sort of changed that stigma and I had a run around in the first 15 and I enjoyed it and yeah, wow. um, never looked back. And uh, then uh, they we had a team in Manirua that, um, that was that was playing. That, it was just starting out, actually, the Manirua Marlins. And um I went down for a run there because my uncle just happened to be coaching. Yeah. Not, not a, he, I, so I, when you say uncle, when you're Māori, you have a lot of uncles and aunties, whether they're <laughs> uncles and aunties. Uncle yeah. yeah. So it was, it was one, a friend's, uh, friend's, family friend's, um, father. Mm. 
mm. who I call uncle, and he was the coach. And so he sort of said, come down for a run. I was like, oh, yeah, keen. Went down and had a run. And when I think back to the people who were playing, you know, there was people like Hurian Emmanuel, who's, you know, black. Black Ferns, Sevens, Legend, Aroha mm. Savage, you know, who's done Black Ferns and Kiwi Ferns. And, you know, they were just young teenagers having a run around. And, um, you know, so we had a we had a very young team. Um, and that was sort of where my journey began in league. So Manero Marlins um, would have been, I would have been 17. And, mm. um, yeah, that's where it all started. Oh, it's mm. funny you say that because I, I was just going to ask a question. Do you reckon if you're a, a young girl coming through, do you reckon it's, it's good to play another sport before coming, you know, to rugby league? Because... I see some of the skills that you kind of picked up that you that have used in rugby league as more transferable kind of skills, which was, you know, just the vision and, and netball kind of, you can transfer it into rugby league. You reckon it's um, good to see? Yeah, definitely. I think coming from netball to rugby league, you have the skills of agility, um, you know, your footwork is there. Not that I've ever been a good step or anything, but, <laughs> um, you know, you have that footwork and agility. Um, it's obviously a different kind of fitness, which I think um, is probably a massive point of difference between well netball and league. But um, I definitely think that there are transferable yeah. skills from, from netball to rugby league. And even if you look at the likes of Portia Woodman, she played yeah. um, netball before she yeah. played rugby, and that's where she was picked up from. So... Um, yeah, and like for young girls that are up and coming, it doesn't matter what sport, you know, that they basketball, belong to, they? basketball, anything. I've seen so many good athletes now that are playing rugby league that have come from all sorts of different yeah. sporting backgrounds, so 100%. Yeah, nice. and, and so you made mention there about obviously there was a, a train of thinking that only boys play rugby league, right? And then you sort of be part of that crew that breaks that mould. And mm. what were the comments? Uh, were there any conversations from from family or friends when you started picking up rugby league and not only picking up rugby league, but actually, you know what, you're pretty good at this thing. Uh, yeah. What was some of the corridor around that? Um, so when initially when I sort of had said to my dad that I wanted a daughter, he never questioned me and dad's always supported me no matter what I wanted to do. And it was never that dad never sort of said, Don't play. It was just something where I, you know, being Māori, you respect your elders mm. and you never want to upset or, 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 you know, or upset anyone. So it was more the fact that I didn't want to be that person to upset my family or go against our family. It's not even a value, but just their beliefs, I guess. Um, I didn't want to go against that. But I mean, I thought if I enjoy it, um, and I do well and I love it, um, it's, it's, it's it's breaking a stigma and it's mm. creating a pathway for my other, you know, family, my cousins, my nieces who may want to play. And now I'm so grateful I did because I have nieces that are excelling in the game. I have mm. cousins mm. that are done well. And um, so, you know, there was there was never any backlash when yeah. I think back at all. Um, and now, you know, my uncles and aunties here who sort of frowned upon it initially are now my biggest supporters. Yeah. So, you know, there's, there's no regrets whatsoever. If anything, I'm so glad that I did it and I'm glad that the, the time that I did it um, was perfect for me because, yeah, like I said, I have um, other nieces and stuff that are doing so well in the sport now. Yeah. And did you think, I mean, did you have ambitions when you, so you said you started playing at 17 sort of formally, did you ever think or have plans or dreams to go on and represent um, New Zealand, uh, play professionally in the sport at 17 years old or did, did that come a bit later just the more you started enjoying the game and? Yeah, that that definitely come later. I always wanted to be a silver fern. Yeah, oh, true. <laughs> yeah, always wanted to be a silver fern. Even when I sort of had stopped playing netball for a little bit and come into rugby league, I, I always thought I would return at some point in time. Yeah, um, I kind of just thought it was just the, the thing that was happening at the time, and I was enjoying it, and my friends were doing it. So I didn't think it was going to be something that was going to continue long term. And I still had ambitions of being a silver fern. And to be fair, I never sort of thought about the kiwi ferns. Um, at, at that age and initially it was kind of later on once I started you know getting better at the game and enjoying mm. it more um, and then opportunities started arising for rep representative sides that I sort of thought you know maybe if I do give up my all I could you know achieve something here happen, eh? so yeah it just sort of gradually happened it was not something that at the offset I was like you know, man, I want to be a, a kiwi fern. Yeah. I sort of, and back then I didn't know too much about the kiwi ferns either. Like yeah. it wasn't as um, dominant as it is now. You know, like yeah. there was not so much. There was not not much TV coverage or any promotional stuff that I would see. Obviously, not so much social media either. So, mm. um, you know, those dreams and ambitions didn't sort of come on till later it's in late. my career. Just one more World Cup titles and the boys. But <laughs> no, it's, it's not untrue. Yeah. I was going to say, you know, I know you're talking about pathways and you've made um, rugby league as a career path, which 
it's it's awesome. But also, I I I, I hear that you're well connected to your culture, you know, and I think some of those values and also those lessons um, played a big part in your career. And I think you know, for some some young um, lady out there that's listening in, how important your culture is, but also carrying on those values um, into your sport or your career. How how um, big of a um, part of you know um, culture played a big part in your career? How did it help out? Yeah, I think um, the biggest thing in relation to my culture is probably the um, the connection, um, mm. the connection with my whanau. Um, my family is such a tight knit unit, um, and you know we're all so close. All my cousins, and we all grew up together. You know, doing stuff together, and I think. That sort of helped me become a, a team player. And, you know, rugby league, it's so important that you are a team player because mm. nobody likes to play with someone who just cares about themselves or, you know. So I think the biggest thing is connection, um, at connection with my teammates and mm. things like that, which is such, if you can't connect with your teammates, it's so hard to be a team, right? So I think that in regards to my culture, um, when I think of uh, everything that I've done cultural-wise is like being at the at the marae with my cousins and right. playing playing um, games with my cousins and just that connection. I think if when I think of culture, that's probably the biggest thing that I've um, transitioned from my cultural aspect into, into playing rugby league is being able to connect with my teammates. And I think another thing probably would be empathy. Yeah. Um, you know, when I think of my culture and, um, you know, the love and everything that my family give to me and that I can give to my family and, and it be accepted is um, something that is also really important in rugby league is empathy. Is it's, mm. it's not just something on the field when you're playing sport. There's a lot of behind the scenes things that people probably wouldn't understand if you didn't play a team sport yeah. that is so important. And I think empathy is one of them that's really, really important. But also identity. I think there's a, you know, we talk especially in the well-being space about our players that are going overseas and kind of losing themselves because yeah. either they've gone over young and then you know forget I'm not saying they forget about their you know where they come from but just the identity you know they get lost in especially in Australia how it's, it's it's a way bigger country than us and and so I think fitting in and also knowing who you are is important and I see that in you I see that in some of our wahine tours that that are doing well but it's because of they know who they are. Yeah. And I think that's important to, for mm. our viewers to know that. Absolutely. Right. And I think um, as you're talking about empathy in, in this sort of professional space, is it difficult to find that, to strike that balance of how do we connect um, but also go out and do a job that everyone's paying for us to do or wrapping around us because we want a result, right? Yeah. In, like, at the top end, no one plays sport to lose. Is it a, a hard balance to find or to strike with trying to make sure that connections are tight and and we're relating, but we've also got to be able to just perform? Do you find that difficult or, or that really hasn't been a challenge for you? Definitely. Mm. I, I, th I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges um, in any team that I've been a part of is, is creating that culture um, amongst the team and and getting buy-in from everyone to yeah. to have the desire to want the same thing. Yeah. And, like, of course, everybody wants to win, yeah. um, but you need to sort of all be on the same page, so to speak, in order for that to happen. And, um, yeah, it's definitely been a challenge in, in sort of every team that I've been a part of. And I guess um, later on in my career when I sort of become captains of teams, that, that became more evident because, you know, as a leader you're, you're trying to create that connection and get yeah. everyone to sort of be connected and feel inclusive and um, sort of want the same result and, um, you know, feel valued and everything in the team. But uh, in order to do that, you know, that that's on the individual themselves and you can only do so much, um, you know, you're mm. in control of what you want and yeah. how you want to do things. But, you know, you want the same thing for the person next to you, but that's up to them and just trying to sort of, communicate with someone and and not push it upon them to be like hey we need to do this in order to get mm. this result it's it's about trying to encourage them to want the same thing um so that they you know they do it freely and they do it on their own free will without you know you pushing them in pushing that direction them, if that makes sense yeah. mm. self-determination kind of yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, there we go. <laughs> oh, <that's just> a, <laughs> that was the only thing I learned. No, in saying that, I think one of the challenges I know the, you know, rugby league is a male-dominated sport. Um, you know, when you came in, what are the, some of the challenges you came in, especially probably the early days, um, even 
given um, in the recent um, um, playing days, what, what are some of the challenges that you've faced as a as a as a female, um, mm -hmm. and it, and how did you deal with it? You know. Yeah, I guess. Um, yeah, you're right, right. It's like male dominated sport, although it is definitely growing in the women's space. Mm. Um, I guess because it's portrayed as a male sport, um, although you know that stigma is sort of on a downward slope, which is good. Yeah. Um, it's there was like I guess things around um, women's physique becoming right. um you know different yeah. or more muscly uh, so to speak and you know there's been a lot of um shade thrown out ab about certain females in the NRLW who are too muscly who yeah, look like right. men or look like males and things like that and those are kind of things that um you know that are, are, are not acceptable obviously but those are the kind of struggles that some of the girls face um yeah. And I guess I, I haven't really faced that myself, but that's definitely one that's become more apparent um, as of late. Mm. Um, and that I guess girls girls say they don't care, but of course you're going to care when someone's throwing shade at you like that. Course, and yeah. that's that's one thing that's definitely um, you know been tough to to vis visualize for, on behalf like from my mates and stuff like that. Um, I guess another one. Um, trying to think of stuff that's more specific to me because I already sort of spoke about not playing it because it's a, a dominant, dominant male sport. But well, I might, just if I can interject, yeah, I, I might ask a couple of questions that might, I think, um, might lead to helping you answer that. Yeah. Maybe, if I can. Um, and I want to do that by, because I think, I think it'll bring it up. That's my point. Yeah. But if, if we go just sort of circle back a little bit to you're playing at the Marlins, 17, and then you start making rep teams, yeah. right? Because in the middle of that, you become a mum. At some point in there, yeah, you become a mum, and it's you know obviously very different from being a male as a parent playing high performance sport, and then a, as a female as a mother as a parent playing high performance sport. Yeah, so you start making these teams, and then you become a mum in that mix. Um, what's that like for for? two males, one that played at the top level and had kids, one that didn't play at the top level but has kids. <laughs> you know, um, we know from our perspective what it's like to be a parent and trying to work and all of that sort of stuff. But um, what are some of the, the challenges that sit around that, Crystal? Yeah. Um, Enlighten where, us. Where do I start? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I think – the biggest challenge is is balancing time. Mm. Um, that's probably, you know time management is is the hardest thing. Um, get into trainings, um, you know, try trying to maintain your trainings on a daily basis. Being a mum, obviously, um, working full time. Um, it's it's all about time management, and I guess I've been doing it for so long that um, it's become the norm. Mm. so to speak, um, but it's definitely had its challenges. And I, I've always been someone who's really, um, I put commitment at the forefront. So I don't like to miss trainings. Um, mm. You know, I don't like to be late. Uh, so I don't like to have excuses. So those are the those are the sort of things that I don't. I try not to let creep in um, when I'm, you know, when I'm trying to be a professional athlete. But even if I'm just going to club, I don't like to be late and those kinds of things. So as a mother, um, you have to be extremely organised to make sure that you get to training on time, that the kids are sorted, dinner's sorted, you know, yeah. um, get them to the babysitter or wherever they've got to go on time, um, and just uh, just about juggling time. Um, but you know, I, I've always thought in the back of my mind when I've sort of you know made rep teams and stuff that you know if I really want something bad enough, there there will be no excuses, and I'll always make it happen. And I've just ensured that I've done that. So, mm. um, you know, I've. I've, I know that it's hard being a mum because I, I do it, but I always try not to let that be an excuse. Sure. Yeah, so sure, it's, it's, it's all a juggling act really, but yeah. yeah, because I'm so passionate about rugby league and where I know where I want to be and what I want to do that I'll do anything um, in order to make it happen. That's not multitasking. What is? Uh, sorry, man, we lost. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, but I mean, Ali's not wrong in the sense that, you know, um, it's very different for our wahine in the game, mm. right? That want to, not just rugby league, but I think as women's sport becomes more and more professional and they get parity, and I know there's some areas where they don't, but as we seek that level of parity, um, the challenges are, are very unique and they're very different. And we, we sort of press back into your story a bit more, and I'm sure you'll talk about it as we go, but you, you make, because if I'm correct, you, you debuted for the Kiwis um, before you ended up playing NRLW. Yeah. Yep. So do you yeah. want to tell us a little bit about um, 
how that came about, uh, how you you made kiwi ferns, and um, and then obviously you're still a mum at that same stage, and some of those challenges, and then being away from home and travel and all of that. What was yeah. that experience like for you? Yeah, my debut was uh, yeah really special, and I was like, uh, my debut was at a packed out um, Eden Park because I what was the um, we had the nines going on, so that was it was very scary. I can vividly remember. I remember like I was so badly shaking from my nerves that like I got into the tunnel and I was like, oh my gosh, I think I need a vomit. And there was a couple of us that were debuting and we both were feeling like we were feeling the same kind of way. I was like shaking, like standing there waiting out to run and you could hear the crowd was going crazy outside and I was like, oh my gosh. And I was debuting um, on the wing, which was like not my position, like obviously. So uh, I was not fast and we were playing Australia. I was like, man, this could go (laughs) one of two ways and um yeah so I just it was it was like there was so many nerves but so much pride at the same time I was you know I was so proud I had just actually returned um to rugby league after a couple of years off so I had um uh, 2008 I was in the Kiwi Fern squad and then uh they were going to a world cup and I didn't make the the traveling the traveling team we continued with footy Um, my mum fell ill um in the interim and then um, I made the squad again, and then 2012 um, they had the World Cup. My mum had passed away, so I didn't do that World Cup either. Um, and then mm. I sort of thought, you know, in that time I was really massively struggling, so I was like, I need to have a break. I need to just focus my attention on my son um, and myself, get myself uh, my myself better in a better headspace. Um, and usually league is that outlet for me. That's usually my happy place and um, where I get that. That, that feeling of, you know, like I'm in my happy place when I'm playing rugby league. But I just was such in a dark place. I needed to just get away from everything mm. um, and just have some time alone. So I had a break for a couple of years. And when I returned to rugby league, um, I actually got a call from the Kiwi Ferns coach at the time. And he had just sort of said, oh, do you want to come down for a run? We've got like a Kiwi Ferns trial just to make up numbers. Um, I was never going to make the team one thing. It was right. just to make up numbers down at Rotorua. So I was like, oh, yeah, sure. So I went down to Rotorua. They had a camp and um, I was still breastfeeding and everything. So it was like, it was a little bit intense for me. And I was <laughs> like, we were like sharing and bunking in this room and I was having to express in front of all these people. It was like, oh, this is really awkward. And I had just sort of come back from, you know, having baby and stuff and um, then he sort of said, um, oh, I'm going to chuck you in the centres. And um, I was like, oh, yeah, sweet as. Like, I have probably not fast enough or whatever, but yeah. I'm just here to make up numbers. And then anyway, we got out onto the field and I looked up and my opposition was Honey. <laughs> and I was <laughs> like, oh, come on. Over, yeah, she yeah. was my opposing centre. And honestly, the whole game, she was just like running at me, running it straight, bowling me over, <laughs> ragdolling me on defence. And I was like, oh, welcome back. Like, you know, that was my welcome back to league. But um, I found my passion again from that camp and Mm. you know that sort of gave me some motivation to get back on the wagon and train again and um yeah so I continued on and um a couple of years later I was actually in the Kiwi Fern so yeah yeah, it's it's it was definitely a journey but um you know I I always think back and I always feel I'm a person that believes that everything happens for a reason Mm. so I was meant to go down to that camp I was meant to get smashed and ragdolled and that sort of is what brought my motivation back yeah sweet honey yeah (laughs) Yeah, sad (laughs) but I was just just thinking about it I was going to ask um you talked about being nervous and I know these are normal things that come with being nervous right so First game, big crowd, all of that. But was there anything else underlined? Was it what it represents for you to have that black jersey of representing your family? Was that what was that a bit of that anxiety or, or nervousness? Was there anything else that sort of sat sat in that space? Yeah, definitely. I, I guess um, never wanting to fail as well. Mm. Yeah, you know, wanting to be successful, wanting to do my country proud. You know, wanting to wear the jersey and do it. You know, do it justice and. I always know that you know you're just a caretaker of the jersey and you want to leave it in a better place than you know when you've when you picked it up. So, I you know I just had I think another word that probably crept into my um into the back of my mind was doubt. You know, mm. am I good enough yeah. to be here? Do I deserve this? Um, and then I'm like, of course I do. You know, it's like yeah, yeah. battling in my head. I've worked hard for this, but then am I good enough? You know, am I gonna make mistakes? Am I gonna do this? So, I think a little bit of doubt, but. 
I'm always so proud to wear the jersey and I think that is where the nerves came from is wanting to do it justice, wanting to, you know, do a good job in the jersey and it being the first time that I was wearing that jersey, I was just like, um, I wanna do the best I can yeah. in this jersey and I don't wanna I don't wanna fail and that made the nerves just go crazy. I was like, Yeah. Yeah. So how do you how did you deal with it? Do you reckon it probably comes better, you know, as you go on or do you reckon it's still the same? I reckon it definitely you always still have nerves, but I just think, you know, you, you learn, you get coping mechan mechanisms of how yeah. to deal with the nerves. And like um, back then when we had, when I had debuted, we didn't sort of, there wasn't much well-being or talk around mm -hmm. how to cope with nerves or anxiety or whatever feelings you may be feeling, you know, in those moments. But, you know, now there's more resources available and great things like this that can yeah. share that space and share that knowledge about um, those moments for yeah. athletes who do, you know, become overawed where you feel like you're going to vomit. Like, it's, and you start <laughs> thinking, can I even run out there? My legs are shaking horrendously right yeah, now. Like, yeah. um, you know, and there's also, you know, in the Kiwi Fern space at World Cup, we had a um, you know, a sports psychologist and mm. those kind of tools were not available back then. So, mm. um, or the introduction of those things into the space, um, are, are, you know, are crucial, I believe, you know, mm. for the girls' um, well-being, for um, how to cope in moments like that. And it's not even just when you're debuting, it's just in general um, how to cope with anything you might not be, uh, you know, might be struggling with in your personal life, but yeah. you're on tour, you know, just things like that, that, you um, you know, is important for an athlete as well as being uh, in a physical shape to perform on the field. Mm, to find your front. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <that's right. laughs> He's on fire today. Um, but no, I think that's really important because, you know, we don't get to hear often enough. We see the spectacle. We see the high-performance athlete and, and them doing their thing. Um, but you never get to hear the reality of mm. – like I think in the back of our mind, right, we know you're human and yeah. – but because – you see the best of that human being on that platform, you forget that it's the stuff, yeah, like you said, mm. outside this that is really what's on our mind. You know, how are my kids doing? Mm. Yes. Um, how is my family at home? Um, who's fixing the washing machine? Because I know it's still broken and I haven't fixed it and I haven't been able to get to it because I've been training, working. Like it's all those little things that begin to add up, right, that you're yeah. saying? And so I think that's really cool that you're sharing that and that's really important and, and for us to hear and to see and then I sort of want to now ask, skip skip forward a little bit to then warrior number nine, right? <laughs> NRLW comes on the scene. It's a new thing. And we've seen what it's becoming now. And we're so excited that uh, the Warriors are having, uh, having a team come back uh, for our game here in New Zealand, how important that is. But what was that experience like, um, Crystal? What was that like to go into the environment, to play on that level, to to wear that jersey? How was that? Yeah, I... That the, the Warriors jersey jersey um, was extremely special to me personally. I I've, I've always grown up watching the Warriors. Obviously, they were they're our home based team, and you know there's you watch NRL all the time. But you know there's always something different about a home based home based team, and um, I watched it all the time with my parents. Um, you know when I watch footy, and probably watched the Warriors more than I've ever watched the international level. Um, and you, th those are sort of where you start seeing your heroes mm. or, you know, those people you aspire to be in the Warriors. And I just think back when I was playing, I never thought that there would be a woman's Warriors. I just yeah. didn't ever think that that would be, you know, the case. I just thought that the, it went from club to international. That, that was the pathway, right? Yeah. So. When they announced that there was going to be a Warriors, I was like, man, how good would that be? <laughs> like, that'll be so amazing. Um, so then, you know, obviously to be a part of it um, mm. was surreal, something so special um, to sort of come to Mount Smart and, and be training um, in a facility that, you know, once was sitting out in the st in the in the bleachers watching the Warriors yeah. to them being underneath the bleachers in the gym training. Like it was something that, you know, you would dream of but never think it would be possible because I never thought there would be a Warriors team. So mm. um, that was something extremely special than, and to be a part of the inaugural team, um, you know, even more special to have uh, someone like Louis um, coaching, um, helping out and, and being the coach, um, I thought was very special and very fitting as well because Louis was, um, you know, the epitome of a of an amazing female woman rugby league player um, mm. back when I first started playing rugby league like 
Um, she was the Kiwi Ferns mm. captain for multiple years. She was such a brilliant player, such a good leader, such a beautiful person. And then she was going to be, um, you know, coaching our Coach. team. Like mm. it just, it was like a dream really. And um, then to be able to play was was so special, super yeah. special. And what were some of the, maybe the challenges that you you found in there? I, I mean, not just, not talking just about being in the Warriors setup now, but NRLW, because you, I mean, you were in it recently as well. Yeah. Um, what's that challenge like for a girl from Manurewa um, to go over and then have to, what there was one being in the Warriors, but then, you know, you mentioned being part of the Knights. Like, what are some of the challenge mm. to a person's well-being uh, that could pop up, that come up for you? Yeah, I think um, if I compare them both, that they, they were both challenging in their own ways, like, with the Warriors, um, we were obviously based here, so flying every weekend. And mm. um, honestly, that that we only did it for like a, a month. And I just, from that point, I was like, I have the utmost respect for the Warriors who do it every weekend or every other weekend for like <laughs> how long. It's it's insane. Like, you know, flying back and forth in a weekend, it's just so draining and so tiring. Mm. Um, how they manage to do it so frequently yeah. and perform the way that they do. Um, it just blows my mind like that. That was probably the biggest challenge for me was um, the turnaround for recovery. You just don't have time for it. And it's just like, you know, these guys are doing it long term for like the whole year and we did it for like a month. Mm. Um, it, it was just so tiring. That was probably the biggest challenge. I just, yeah, at the, at the time when we, at the inaugural year, I had fractured ribs or like a fracture in my ribs. So I was getting injections before every game. And then so I was waking up after the game in so much pain and then having to fly. Wow. And like that was something new too. Like, you know, when you b become into that high performance space, you do anything to play. And, yeah. you know, my body suffered as a consequence. But, you know, you just want to play. And those are the things you do. So those injections and then waking up the next day being an so much pain and then having to fly I thought man that's the normal for you know mm. for the men you know they do it mm. all the time and um, I think that was probably the biggest challenge and then on the flip side when I went to Knights I relocated to Australia for three months and that was probably even tougher because I was away from my yeah. family so um, I think because the the time when I went over for Knights last year there was still COVID floating about too so travel was still a little bit restricted um, as well so we sort of when we went over there um, I had sort of planned initially for uh, to fly home a couple of weekends in between, but then that wasn't possible. So then our team got wiped out by COVID and that was my first time getting COVID. So I was like yeah. super sick. So, but, you know, like when I compare to, um, and there's no downplaying that because we do it for a shorter period of time, the men yeah. are worse off. It just made me respect the men so mm. much more for what they do, you know, week in, week out. It's just, it's just crazy. And then to think that they had to relocate, um, for a couple yeah. of years mm -hmm. away from, well, some away from family like uh, yeah it's just crazy and but it just shows like how much um you know people have passion for a sport and you know what sure, you're willing yeah. to do in order to continue to play like yeah. yes yeah those were probably the two biggest struggles was the 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 travel and being away from family and then also just the turnaround and recovery to get the body prepared to mm -hmm. then back it up the next week and, and still try and perform to the best yeah. of your ability yeah right and i think keeping it you know, um, not just focusing on the challenges, I think, what were some of the things that helped? Like what was, you know, because obviously we sit here with you today and I know there are always things going on for, for all of us, for yourself in the background that we're trying to manage in life. But you, see, my point is you sit here seemingly well, yeah. right? Um, so it didn't destroy you, but yeah. so there, was, there must have been some things that helped you get through those times. Um, shed a bit of light on what some of those things might have been? Yeah, um, I think through rugby league, um, the best thing I've ever gained out of any team um, through my whole career is friendships. Mm. And I think um, the friendships that you make in the team um, is something that will always help you with those struggles that you're going going mm. through. Um, also, obviously, the obvious one is family. Like, you know, your family is always going to be there, support you, and my family have, you know, just done phenomenal things in order for me to do what I've done in my career. But when I think about the team environment, um, having good friendships and good teammates is, is so crucial and important to mm. getting through those struggles. And um, I think the the dif point of difference between those friendships and obviously your family supporting you is they're going through the same thing as you, you know, like in regards to mm. whatever struggles you might be having in the team mm. environment, you're all sort of facing it together. So you can relate, you can support each other 
And um, that's probably one of the main things that's helped me is, is the connections and the friendships that I've made on my footy journey. And um, they've been able to pull me through. And when I think back to um, the nights, especially, and then also probably the Warriors as well was um, having Auntie Calms as our well-being. Mm. She was, she's just phenomenal. Like I could not speak highly enough of Auntie Calms mm. and the support that she provided. Um, you know, even though she can't physically be there, like, just a Zoom call, just to see her face, man. Yeah. She just, she's just such an amazing woman, and she just has all the right things to say. She just, yeah, her support is, is has helped me so much in my career, and you know, I'll forever owe Auntie Combs. Mm. Yeah, awesome. shot comes, but shot Spencer. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but no, just to, to offer you in total with that, like you know, Carmen's such an, an important mm. figure, eh, in the well-being space. Definitely. And not just for our wahine. I think there's so many people that people mm. don't even know about that she's helped and supported. Yeah. Um, and I think to that point wider is having people that understand the space, having people that have a heart to care. And that's why these well-being roles are so important, I think, um, you know, in some of the other conversations we've had with people, they've said similar things about their support networks and it's those connections, mm. it's relationships, it's people that have a real sense of empathy and mm -hmm. understanding that aren't here because you put a jersey on and you're famous. It's they care about you as a person, right? And that's the stuff that matters most. Um, so really cool. Appreciate that, Crystal. Uh, got a couple more things to sort of ask and then we're going to round it out. Is she going to do the dance? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> nah. um, what are you doing now? Because mm -hmm. you, you're still, I mean, we see, we get to see you on Sky TV. And, but tell us a little bit about that, how that came about and what you're doing now. Um, yeah, and then I'll, I'll ask one more question just to sort of round us off at the end. Yeah, so now I am um, spending more time with my family, actually. Like, um, I've been so full on with footy, obviously, being away. Yeah. Um, and then, obviously, at the nights, and then we had World Cup. So it's, it's been a long time away from family. Um, so I've been spending a lot of time with family, which I've been absolutely loving. Um, and work-wise, yes, I'm working at Sky doing the um, Warriors um, panel and commentary, um, which I'm really enjoying. So that was something that came about in, I think it was like 2018, and oh, yeah. our, our inaugural year. Yeah, when we had Warriors and I was a guest speaker, then mm. I sort of went back on, they asked me to go back. So, um, yeah, I've been doing that since then and it's just become a regular thing, which I'm really enjoying at the moment. Um, so, yeah, I've been doing that this year um, and I've been, I'll have been i be doing it throughout the year. So the lashes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah lash, uh, lash tech as well, um, which is sort of haven't had too much time for, but I'm still sort of doing that and which gives me a good chance to catch up with friends when they come and get their yeah, lashes nice. did. Um, yeah, so that's sort of where I'm at at the moment, um, just my commentary I just stuff. I a brain where we should call it Lash Go. <laughs> so if you want a last call, bring up, bring up Crystal. Holla. I won't invoice for that one. Um, nah, nah, it's all good. That's awesome. And to hear that you're doing stuff outside of footy, like that's what it's all about, right? Who we are. Yeah. Uh, it's not just about what we do, it's who we are that, that fully rounds us out. Um, and, you know, I'm happy to say too, like, we're really grateful to have Crystal as one of our mm. NZRL ambassadors, you know, for the women's space. Um, starting to do some stuff on well-being, which is really, really cool as well. So we just appreciate everything you bring to the space, Crystal. I've got one last question. Um, the show is obviously called Find Your Front, and you know that's a good hearty rugby league term, uh, a coaching phraseology and a way of sort of playing the game. But, you know, we, we talk about Find Your Front being uh, those mechanisms, those tools we can use to help us push through challenges, uh, not just in, in the game of rugby league, but also in life for you. Uh, as your parting pearls of wisdom, what would be, uh, if you reflect back on your career, uh, your life right now, um, what are some ways, some things you do to find your front or, if we put it in real simple terms, things that keep you well? What, what do you practice? What do you do? Um, I think the thing that keeps me well at the forefront is, is ex exercise. Mm. Yeah. No matter whether I was playing footy or not or being an athlete or whatnot, exercise is definitely what makes me feel good. Mm. So, you know, there'll be, times we've been as you know I've been in hospital for the last couple of weeks in and out with my baby and my partner and the only thing that can sort of get my head right is if I go out of my gym and just do a workout that that is what makes me feel good that's that's how I find my front um nice. you know it makes me feel good but I, I also do it like little things such as um I do journaling which um it, it helps me express get anything out of my head onto paper um if there's any anything bad I guess in my head I need to get it out just I, I journal 
I write down, um, which is a good way for me to um, express myself. Um, to my, it's just a personal journal, just mm. something you know that I can get get anything out of my head onto a piece of paper, mm. so it's not festering in my head. Yeah, yeah. So it's that's good. one thing um, that I also do um, is journaling. Um, also. Diet, nutrition is something important for me because when I eat crap food, it makes me feel crap. And I do it often. I go on these things where I eat bad and then I and then I eat healthy. And right. when I eat bad, I, I don't feel good mentally. So I, I try and get my nutrition. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, I agree. I agree. And just um and just keeping connections with, with friends and mm. family. Yeah. That's really important to me. Um, knowing how everyone's doing and that's been very hard. I haven't had social media for about a month or so. So yeah, yeah. it's been very hard to to have those connections and I never knew how much I relied on social media to connect with people. So back to the old school texting and um, and calling, which has yeah. actually been a good thing. Um, nice. So, yeah, just connecting with other people also is how I find my front. Nice. Awesome. That was a good slogan, man. So because of your rapping, oh, you just wagger. <laughs> stop now. The red is. Like <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's not about me anyway. Um, but no, Crystal, look, hey, thank you so much mm. for your time, uh, your aroha, your honesty, your transparency with all of this conversation, and I know it's going to help um, a lot of people that you know, at whatever point it is that they pick this up, listen to it, um, connect in. But to have you still around the game, working in the space, is a real, real privilege and a pleasure for all of us is there anything you wanted to add before we close nah, sign just, off yeah just want to say thank you too and love the inside love your your pearls of wisdom and um yeah and just you know seeing what you're what you're doing now it's awesome so yeah bless you and whatever that you're doing and not only yourself but your family too mm. thank you guys Lash tech, let's go <laughs> yeah let's go find your friend <laughs>